Alright you fucking heroes. Turok Dinosaur Hunter has a plethora of weapons at his disposal in his struggle to defeat the campaigner. From the humble bow and arrow to the heft of the mighty fusion cannon. Grenade and missile launchers, shotguns and assault rifles, there's something for everyone. But one of the most versatile weapons is one often overlooked by casual players of the game, the simple knife. Often considered as a weapon of last resort for when all other ammunition is depleted, the knife hides some brutal secrets beneath that shiny surface. This is the story of how the lowliest weapon in the game went from the last resort to the last word in dinosaur hunting. In a normal playthrough of the game, you are initially provided with a knife and your trusty tech bow. It's after facing only a single enemy that Turok finds a pistol directly in his path, and from there, there's no stopping him. But despite a readily available formidable arsenal, one speedrunner dared to ask the question, is it possible to run this game using nothing but the knife? Pale, regular holder of the Turok Any% and the 100% world records, began to investigate. What he found was to create a whole new category for speedrunning Turok. But before we get ahead of ourselves, a little background. The knife which Turok wields is more than meets the eye. For one thing, killing certain enemies with the knife gives the chance for a special pickup to spawn, the Mortal Wound. Here's what the Turok manual has to say about Mortal Wounds. Although Turok is adept at using high-tech weaponry, he is also deadly with the weapons of his heritage. If Turok slays an enemy with his knife, a special Mortal Wound pickup may emerge. If it does, grab it quickly. This pickup will raise Turok's hit point level by 5 points. Not a bad incentive for using the weapon, and it stacks up to 4 times, giving Turok an extra 20 hit points in total. Though a rare pickup, only spawning, on average 5% of the time, if you keep stabbing, you'll eventually see a lot of these. The second hidden mechanic that isn't apparent at first is the backstabbing feature. When Turok is face to face with a regular enemy, the damage he can deal ranges from 15 hit points at the high end, all the way down to 1 for the stronger enemies, even dealing no damage at all to robots. These large walking weapons platforms can be encountered in levels 7 and 8. but. If Turok takes his enemies from behind, then the backstabbing mechanic comes into play. The conditions are simple enough. You need to be close in to the enemy, and in this 80 degree arc when you strike. When this happens, the normal damage ranges for the knife are thrown away in favour of the much higher flat rate of 30 hit points of damage. For enemies such as the Insectoid Aliens or the Dimetrodon, for which the knife only deals one point of damage, this can make a huge difference. But where the knife excels is when backstabbing grunts. When Turok manages this, the knife deals a devastating blow, killing instantly by inflicting a blistering 999 hit points of damage. To demonstrate the power of the backstab, a raptor, spawning with 50 hit points will be our test subject. (coughs) 
When fighting with this beast face to face, the knife does a paltry three points of damage. That means that to kill a raptor from full health requires 17 swipes with the knife. A difficult proposition if health is scarce. But if backstabbing a raptor inflicts 30 hit points of damage, then it only takes two well-positioned swipes to finish her off. With the added bonus that you have to be at the safer, blunt end of the raptor to achieve this. This method even works on the giant robots, making it the only way to dispatch these mechanised monsters with the knife. There are several times during a run of Turok where an enemy needs to be killed in order to advance. Killing this Perlin lowers a gate. Dispatching this alien raises a pillar. In these instances, the backstabbing mechanic is essential for a quick kill and a speedy exit. But the effectiveness of the default blade was never in doubt. And now we've familiarised ourselves with today's weapon of choice, we can move on to the biggest stumbling block standing in the way of making a knife-only speedrun possible. The bosses. Thunder. Campaigner's biomechanical T-Rex with an assortment of savage attacks. From the snap of those formidable jaws to blazing fire breath and even a red eye-mounted laser. Towering above Turok like a mountain of metal and muscle, Thunder might look like the most formidable opponent Turok could possibly face with nothing but a small knife in his hand. But this David and Goliath encounter in the game has a similar ending to the fable. Thunder might be big and have the most hit points of any enemy in the game, a whopping 6,000. But size is often traded for speed, and this is no different. Despite Turok only managing to deliver 25 hit points of damage per swipe, requiring a not inconsiderable 240 hits in total, it's remarkably easy to remain behind Thunder, out of range of every single one of his attacks. Backstabbing a boss doesn't inflict any extra damage, so this takes a while, and he doesn't keep still. So long as you keep up with him turning, this boss, in spite of first impressions, is actually the easiest of all. Not only that, as the fight goes on and Thunder becomes more damaged, his turning speed is affected, making it even easier to keep out of range of any attacks. An additional bonus when attacking this T-Rex with a knife has to do with his roaring animation. When Thunder roars, he has several seconds of invincibility. It's always a time waster when he decides to roar, but that's never an issue when attacking with a knife. Why? Thunder's roar is considered a ranged attack by the game code, which can only be triggered when Turok is more than a rather specific 174.08 units of length distant. Staying in close enough to hit with the knife means that this condition is never met, and Thunder can be dispatched in the same amount of time it takes to swipe 240 times with the knife. Each time, every time. Campaigner, a cybernetic warlord bent on conquering the multiverse. But before he does, a Native American with a knife has something to say about that. Although the final boss of the game, 
the campaigner is only slightly more tricky than Thunder to deal with. Using the same tactics of staying behind him as much as possible and swiping when in range, he only takes 150 hits before his 3000 hit points are reduced to zero. The difficulties come in the form of his erratic behaviour. Sometimes he'll turn towards you and try and catch you with his club, sometimes he'll backflip away and instigate a ranged attack, and if you're very unlucky, he'll teleport to one of two gun emplacements high on the walls of the arena, far out of reach. But mostly, it's just melee attacks that you have to be careful of. Whilst these attacks hit hard, with a little practice, it's straightforward enough to read his signals and get out of the way of his four-pronged club. So, much like Thunder, some tight movement and a little patience will drop this boss. That's two down, but they can't all be as easy as this, can they? The Long Hunter taunts the player before calling forth a jeep, whereupon he retreats to the edge of the arena, protected by a personal force field as he eagerly watches Turok contend with the machine gun and missile fire. But that's not all. Once the first jeep has been taken care of, a second jeep enters the arena, for the dance to begin anew. Knife versus jeep doesn't sound particularly balanced. But don't be fooled. It was Pale that pioneered the research that brought this run to fruition, but, as always, it was built from a foundation of known strategies, and the boss encounters were no different. For a start, it was known that in an earlier patch of the game, it was possible to use the backstab mechanic on jeeps. Whilst doing little more than scratch the paintwork from the front, taken up the tailpipe, the knife annihilated them. In this earlier patch, when backstabbing with the knife, you would automatically inflict 999 damage, unless an enemy had been specifically excluded in the programming. For some reason, the jeeps had been missed from the list of exceptions, meaning that the jeeps, with only 750 hit points, could be taken out with a single swipe of the knife. Could this help with this first boss encounter? It seems promising. Until closer investigation of Long Hunter's personal force field. Long Hunter's force field is excellent when it comes to turning away projectile weapons. The same cannot be said for a knife attack. Chirok's blade sails clean through it. In this passive state, until the second jeep is destroyed, Long Hunter is an easy target, even going so far as to act as a human shield for the jeep's machine guns and missiles. A knife slash on Long Hunter deals 15 damage, and with his hit points starting at 1000, it's going to take 67 stabs to whittle that away to zero. You can tell that you've reduced his hit points to zero when he freezes in place. With the two jeeps destroyed and Long Hunter out of the picture, the reward of a key to level 5 is normally revealed in the centre of the arena. The only problem? Killing Long Hunter this way means that even with him dead, the pillar hasn't raised, and the key hasn't spawned. The game is waiting for you to deal with the jeep. The solution? Let the jeep kill you. It may sound drastic, but respawning in the arena forces the game to check whether Long Hunter has been killed, and if it finds he has been, it triggers the process of spawning the key. With a method for taking care of the Long Hunter, that was three bosses down, only one to go. Mantis. She's big, fast, vomits acid and guards the last key in the catacombs. 
Dealing with this adversary with only a knife had the possibility of creating an impenetrable barrier at the end of level 5. To begin with, Chirok arrives in the boss arena with the spinning key teasing us just ahead, right in front of a large stone statue. Approaching the key causes it to retract beyond reach, and the statue, just a stony shell, bursts open to reveal Mantis in all her furious glory. Now it's a fight for your life as Mantis does all she can to dissuade Turok from continuing. The first phase has Mantis attempting to spit acid and swipe at Turok with her serrated forelimbs. Once her health has dipped below 75%, she moves on to her second phase. This begins with Mantis entirely ignoring the player as she goes around the arena knocking over four walls that open the space up for the latter stages of the battle. Once the walls are down, she's back to swiping and spitting acid, although now she can jump from wall to wall until her health has been reduced to below 50%. Phase 3 is signalled by an increase in speed and an extra attack in addition to melee and acid damage, the Red Bombs. Why a giant mantis can scatter explosive balls on Turok is uncertain, but she now has the ability to fly up to the ceiling and remain at distance while executing this area attack. Phase 4 begins when her health falls below 25%, and although she does increase her speed once more, the attacks remain the same, until she's finally brought down and the key is revealed. And to contend with that, even with the game's explosive arsenal at your disposal, is not for the faint of heart. To do so with only a knife seems positively suicidal. Few things were already known about this particular encounter that could help. For instance, much like Long Hunter, whilst still encased in stone, although unable to be affected by gunfire, Mantis can still be stabbed. The problem being that to get close enough to land a knife hit on Mantis, you must have already triggered her activation sequence. It was Pale's continuing experimentation that was to reveal nuances in the Mantis fight that were to eventually provide the key. First, he discovered that her melee swipes would miss Turok's hitbox if he was close enough to Mantis, meaning that only her acid attacks could hurt in this position. It was then found that strafing left and right in front of Mantis during her first phase could, if you were lucky, trigger an internal loop in her AI that she can't break out of, leaving her twitching, helpless, and slowly sliding backwards. Stray too far away, and the spell would be broken, but when attacking with a knife, that's not a problem. What specific conditions trigger this behaviour is not yet known although examination of the code suggests that it might have something to do with activating and blending animations. If true, that would make this strategy one of the very few in a Turok run that is entirely reliant on randomness, because Mantis uses random number generation to decide which attacks and animations to perform. If Mantis remained in this state for the entire fight, that would be ideal. Unfortunately, as soon as her health is sufficiently reduced, she moves on to phase 2 and begins knocking down walls. However, it's here that another look at the game's internal workings reveals something interesting. Nowhere in the code does it check if any other hitboxes are impeding the movement of Mantis when she's deciding which walls to break down. If Turok, Mantis, and a wall line up just right. When she breaks out of her trance and tries to smash down the walls, she'll be trapped, running on the spot. Pale first discovered the tactic in this spot. And later still, 
Benetti would find another setup that would prove itself in the current world record. Thanks to the fact that she slowly slides backwards whilst in this loop, and with her continuously facing the player, it's possible to position Mantis in these specific locations before triggering the next phase, making the setup safe and consistent. Because Mantis entirely ignores Chirok until all four walls have been destroyed, no matter what phase she's in, he is now free to deliver the remaining 89 swipes required to reduce her initial 3000 hit points to zero at his leisure. With what he'd learned in his hours of study, investigation and experimentation, Pale had everything he needed to get the very first complete playthrough of Turok Dinosaur Hunter using only the knife. Now, all he needed to do was run it. And, on the 17th of February, he started this run. He came out of the gate strong, finding that sweet spot for the backstabs. The unpredictable nature of the jeep could have been a real problem in the Long Hunter fight, but Pale's deft movement and a spot of good fortune won the day. There was a dicey moment in the Canyon of Death, but with lightning reaction times, the run continued in earnest. Though the knife doesn't give you much to work with when you're backed into a corner, when it's all you have, you make do. With a clean Mantis setup, only a few seconds short of optimal, this run was shaping up to be the one. When enemies don't play along, it can be frustrating, but a little manipulation can get them playing right into your hands. Thunder got a few nips in early on, but after a dizzying two and a half minutes, he eventually fell to Pale's knife. The campaigner did a lot of jumping early on. He got a few desperate last hits in when he could. Die! Sorry sir, that's going to be you. But he was no match for Pale's onslaught. And there we have it everyone. The first valid knife only percent run. It was the culmination of many hours of work, but with the final knife blow Pale had made history beating the entirety of Turok Dinosaur Hunter with only a knife in 39 minutes and 43 seconds. Since then, the record has been pushed down even further, but that first run and the story of its development will forever be remembered as a triumph of tenacity and determination against incredible odds. <laughs>